Hello, this is Peter Bell, and I'm here with Mr. Tony Baresi from Triumph Gold. Hello, Tony. Hello, Peter. Very nice to be talking to you. The first time, uh, my first time to speak with you, uh, I gathered you're a very uh, accomplished geologist. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, you know, these porphyry systems um, in particular, it seems like they are some of the most well understood or, or most interesting or, or most varied and yet uh, also kind of consistent maybe ar around the world or maybe that just says something about my understanding. Uh, of a tremendous amount of work that's gone into understanding the, the genesis of porphyry deposits and there's a lot of models out there but uh, I don't think that there's a model that fits a, a single porphyry perfectly. Each one of them is, is really a, a beast in, unto itself so you have to be able to learn to recognize the patterns without being sort of stuck in the, in trying to, um, you know, check all the boxes to be sure that you, that you've got it because you'll never check all the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the wonders of nature, all the, the curve balls and variation she gives us. That's right. Yeah. Wonderful news flow from the company here. I like that release yesterday. Uh, sorry, last week, um, looking at a couple nice pictures of core and everything like that. Uh, yeah, I so wonder. one of the great things about um, the discovery that we made this year is that, you know, por porphyries are kind of a dime a dozen through the um, through Western <laughs> North America. There's, there's probably tens of thousands of them, and, and most of them will never uh, make it. Uh, the, the, the conditions that you know bring porphyries in uh, into the upper levels of the crust allow for mineralization to happen in all kinds of, of different places, um, but it's a select few that actually have potentially economic grade. And uh, a lot of projects that people invest in are projects that are predicated on kind of grade uh, that can make a mine in the Yukon. Uh, and in fact, we think that this may be the, the highest grade porphyry intersection that's been made in the Yukon. Uh, and really? so what we've done with that is we've demonstrated that we have a porphyry here that's potentially economic, and we've done it in the best possible way, which is showing an economic intersection, but not one economic intersection but multiple economic intersections. Um, and now what we're doing is we're plugging away at trying to expand upon that and see if, see what the, the size of this thing is, see if we can discover more of it. Well, and that's the challenge with these deposit types. A lot of work required to delineate a billion tons of ore. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, we've put out a couple of drill holes into this really high-grade stuff. Um, that we discovered uh, with one drill hole last year and then followed up and, and had a number of intersections so far this year. Um, and, you know, the, the size of what we've discovered is, is nothing compared to what, what a mine will potentially be. Uh, and so we've, we've really got a lot of work ahead of us to expand on this. Um, but at least we're at the stage where we know that this porphyry, um, that it's not a bust. It, it did concentrate the metals enough to give us economic grade. So yeah. we're well past that, that sort of uh, uh, hurdle, which 98% uh, of the porphyries that people are exploring out there haven't passed that hurdle. Yeah. Well, and it's so nice to have a large property too, uh, 200 square kilometers. Great, lots of area to look around. <laughs> but, that's right. Yeah, we have a, a district scale property, and it's uh, it's in one of the one of the most prospective areas within the Yukon. Uh, we're along a, a very important fault structure called the Big Creek Fault, uh, and it's an important controlling structure um, all the way up through into Alaska. Uh, and it it's an important control, for instance, uh, at Gold Corp's coffee deposit, uh, which is to the to the northwest of us, and we have the the longest road accessible portion of that fault, 
Um, the area that we're exploring right now is just a six kilometer um, long stretch of the fault, uh, fault zone. Uh, and we see that entire six kilometer area as being part of a single evolving magmatic hydrothermal uh, system with porphyry and epithermal components. And, and by using that idea that that whole area is um, a single system, uh, that's how we ended up being able to vector in on this stuff that we've now discovered. But our property is actually 20 kilometers long, and we're developing porphyry targets all throughout that 20 kilometer length. Yeah. Um, most of them are at a much more grassroots stage than uh, what this is. Uh, but uh, they have, you know, we're checking off the boxes that they've got all of the right components, of what we need <laughs> to proceed to farther or, or, or different levels of exploration. And so much to discuss and all that. Um, looking at the presentation and then the blue sky, uh, I don't see blue sky on um, the, the map of the property with all these uh, zones that you've drilled and the, the three deposits that you have 43101 resources on. That's right. So blue sky was Last year, blue sky was exactly that. It was nothing more than a blue sky opportunity. Um, we were looking at the, the two spots on the map that are labeled revenue and nucleus, yeah. and they contain the two largest resources on the map, but they themselves are contained within a six kilometer intense multi-element soil uh, anomaly with a coincident geophysical anomaly. Um, and so we separated out different zones within that area and everything to the east of revenue we called the blue sky zone because it had seen so little work but had yeah. so much potential. Um, and that's where we conducted um, some drilling last year, had our discovery hole of what we're calling the blue sky porphyry, which was um, I think 58 meters of a gram gold and 0.3 copper. And we said, wow, that's what we need to find more of to be able to um, mine a porphyry in the Yukon. And so we followed up on that and the blue sky zone has turned into an actual zone <laughs> of, <laughs> of gold rich high grade porphyry material. Wow. And that's with one hole in it last year that just clipped something and now this year, one hole that's into it over 100 meters. Um, and I, I guess a lot more work to be, to be done there. Actually, our last press release, we put out three holes, all okay. of which went into the Blue Sky Zone Porphyry. Um, so the, the title of the release had uh, 125 meters of 1.25 grams gold and 0.3% copper, seven grams silver. Uh, and that was um, just an included interval within a much broader zone of mineralization from that one hole. Yep. Well, we have another hole that was 94 and, a half, 94 and a half meters of a gram and a half gold and 0.28% copper. Yep. And then a third hole um, that was a bit lower grade um, and it had um, about 150 meters of 0.3 gold and 0.15% copper but that hole bottomed in the highest grade mineralization of the hole um, at 524 meters, where we had 15 and a half meters of 0.8 grams gold and 0.27% uh, copper. So we've, we've put three holes into, into this thing now and demonstrated that you know, it's, it's sizable, it's continuous, and it's high grade throughout the entire body. Um, and so those are the three holes that we've released, yep. um, but we also announced that we've drilled an additional seven holes into the zone, and you can expect those results to be coming out in the, in the weeks to follow. Did you say seven holes? Seven additional holes, yes. Wow, so a nice 10 for this, for this season, um, and the lengths on these too, right? <laughs> nice holes for porphyry exploration here. That's right. It doesn't cut it to get, you know, just 50 meter intersections in this stuff. You need to get hundreds of meters because these are real bulk tonnage targets. Well, and thanks for mentioning that whole 
five, I guess it is there, ended in mineralization or, or the richest um, down hole. You have a, a section that shows 16 and 17, um, but it doesn't show five. And it looks like there's some nice kind of vertical continuity between the high grade intervals in 16 and 17 in that, in that section there. That's right. Yep. And, uh, you know, demonstrating that continuity is critical to um, developing these kinds of resources. And so just having, you know, those two on that section, along with a few other things, um, we think that we, we're going to be able to develop this from a discovery this year into a resource probably uh, after some drilling next year. Well, and it's something, yeah, you guys certainly have a lot of experience. <laughs> were all three of the 43101s on the property done by? They were done by arm's length. Um, yeah, the consultant. geological consultants. Um, that's right. Uh, and they were done uh, during a, a previous iteration of the company yeah. uh, under a different name called Northern Free Gold Resources. Yeah. Yeah. So, this so is, since then, we've changed our name and the management of the company, but it's, it's essentially, um, you know, if you had stock in that company, you have stock in ours. <laughs> well, and, and the interview that's out today um, with the next bull market move, uh, Executive Chairman John Anderson, he speaks about um, having been behind this story for <laughs> some time now, right? Uh, going back to the free gold days and uh, thinking about the companies working in your neighborhood there, uh, Rockhaven really jumps out at me. Uh, what a, an, an, another story of dogged determination, right? Oh man, those guys are fantastic. Uh, yep. They have, you know, they started off um, not too many years ago with, with one vein and through really systematic and smart exploration. They did geophysics and soils and trenching and drilling. And now they've got, what, eight vein structures and they're just adding to their resource over and over and over again. And we're using their lead at our Tinted deposit because um, Tinted is a very similar vein to what they've got at Plaza. Um, so we've, we've started doing uh, VLFEM surveys and soils and trenching over there uh, to see if we can have the same kind of success that they've had at, at Plaza. And so far, it looks like we've defined um, an anomaly that is partly uh, proven to be a vein through trenching um, that looks to be twice the length of the actual tint of vein that has uh, contains our resource. Yeah. So we're uh, we're pretty excited about that, and we've got to give a give a shout out to Rockhaven for sort of showing how that that determination and that kind of work can can lead to a lot of success. Well, and information exchange too, right? Like you go back in the history of this area and the miners were certainly trying to learn as much as possible from each other's success and failures. Uh, and of course, you know, that continues today. That's right. And you know, there's a real attitude up here of, of that we're all in it together. It's a pretty <laughs> fantastic place to work. You know, just today, I went up and took a look at uh, one of the local placer miners and uncovered some, some new material in one of the creeks and let us know that it was there. And we went up and took a look and there's some beautiful mineralization that had never been exposed. And they had the, the thought to, you know, let us know. And, and we were able to go up and take a look at it. And we're all working together up here. It's, it's pretty great. Well, and, and coming back to what you said about the highest grade porphyry, in the Yukon, right? Like that's a pretty, it's a good, sounds like a bold claim maybe to some. Um, somebody's got to have it though, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I, I have not uh, been able to find anything that's, that's better than what, what we, uh, the results that we've put out. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not making the definitive claim I'm quite happy to have someone come up and, and show me some other results. But, uh, you know, I, I've thrown down the gauntlet. <laughs> if you've got one, let me know. <laughs> well, and, and what you found at Blue Sky could get better too, right? Because it's, it's got the gold there, but the copper numbers could, could increase from, from where they are just, you know, by virtue of the zonation within the porphyry potentially. Absolutely. And, you know, we've got seven more holes to put out news 
about. So stay tuned. Uh, and, uh, you know, it helps, I guess, to have some pictures of the core there. And, you know, just to point out that it's not, you haven't clipped some of the freak show uh, tourmaline breccia pipes or something like that that come off some of these porphyries and come with some very uh, high grade material, but over very localized areas. Well, I guess that's the question, right? What what part of the system you might be in and where it extends to and this and that? Yeah, so obviously that's the biggest question that we're, we're trying to answer right now. And we've done that somewhat with drill. Um, and we've, we've decided that it's time now to step back and uh, take a careful look at all of our data um, so that we can design a, a really robust exploration program to test the extent of the thing next year rather than just willy-nilly poking holes everywhere trying to follow up on uh, poorly developed ideas. Um, well, yeah. And so we, we build the additional seven holes. Uh, and in addition to that, we're also planning a uh, e survey, um, which we expect will give us um, data down to a depth of uh, eight or nine hundred meters uh, below surface. Uh, so we're we're looking for things uh, along strike near surface, and we're also looking for deep targets um, for the surface uh, work or, or tr to try to help us with the surface exploration. We've um, done a a new soil grid with very dense spacing over all of the area that we think is prospective. Uh, so over the winter, we're going to look at all of the all of the data that we have from the drill hole, uh, come up with a, a sort of model of what we uh, think we've we've discovered, uh, and use that geological model to um, aid our exploration next year. But we'll also have all of these other tools um, like IP survey. We're doing a mag survey. Um, and the new soil survey over the area. So we're going to have a really robust data set to move forward and, and do some some well thought out exploration next year to to make this thing thing bigger and, and hopefully better. Well, and it's it is interesting to see the soils picking up you know thousand parts per billion gold in the heart of the revenue there, and a little bit off to the east as well. Uh, it's kind of maybe yeah surprise it. I guess it should remind it makes sense in the Yukon, right? There's, there's some there sure is. You mentioned the placer miners revealing new mineralization at surface. Uh, there is gold. There is copper. There are all this stuff in this area. That's right. So this six kilometer soil anomaly that we're uh, conducting exploration within, and which encompasses the blue sky zone, it's drained by four creeks, uh, and all four of those creeks. Um, have either active or historical plaster operations. And in fact, the one that drains down out of revenue is renowned as having had the uh, Dawson Range's richest, richest plaster channel um, that was just loaded with gold. There's a, a really well-known picture from the creek of a guy holding a, a gold pan that's so heavy it's, it's bowing underneath <laughs> the weight of all the gold in it. <laughs> and... <laughs> Surface claims, uh, mineral claims. Uh, the the placer operators who are you know looking at those creeks today are they they are they on your property or off? That's right. They're they have the surf they have the surface claims yeah. um, which overlap with our uh, with our um, bedrock claims. Well, we can call them your advanced prospecting team or something like that. That's right. Yeah, it's a real advantage having them around because they're they're digging stuff up and uh, showing it to us. And a lot of the time, you know, the last thing that that uh, hard rock explorationists are allowed to do is dig up creek beds, right? Like that's that's something that we'd never be permitted to do. Um, yeah. But the plaster miners can do it, and we can take <laughs> advantage of that, and and we do all the time. It's great. Yeah. And I guess lots of coarse gold there in the the creek coming off the revenue. Not doesn't look like it's finely you know um, weathered down or or eroded into finer gold there. Hopefully to see some big nasty rugged chunks 
that didn't move very far? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. There's uh, there's some you know many multi ounce nuggets that come out of Revenue Creek and also Mechanic Creek, which drains uh, the nucleus deposit area. And actually, there's a, a professor at at University of British Columbia that came and did a study of the gold, the Basser gold in the creeks, um, to see what type of uh, what type of um, origin the gold has. And in Revenue Creek, for instance, uh, they discovered that the gold had a, an association with a, a mineral called uh, bismuthinite. Uh, and a lot of the gold that we're discovering uh, with our new drilling is gold in association with bismuthinite. So, and bismuthinite is a mineral that, that uh, weathers and rusts exceptionally quickly. Um, so for there to be bismuthinite in association with those gold nuggets, it means it hasn't gone very far and, and we've found the source of it. That's what, that's what we're drilling right now. Wow. And to people who might ask, uh, you know, oh, has all the gold been eroded away and the placer miners have it and you guys are left with the roots or the tail end of what was originally there, I guess uh, that deep penetrating IP will give a pretty good sense of vertical extent. Uh, good thing about these porphyry systems is they they can to continue vertically for a long time that's right yeah we haven't gotten to the bottom of anything that we've been drilling yet uh, so <laughs> wonderful uh, yeah how many rigs have you been have you had up there for that 10 hole program is that just one uh, we've been drilling since so the program has been a lot more than just the blue sky uh, porphyry we've been doing a bunch of exploration um, throughout the throughout the soil anomaly and and even uh, across other parts of the property um, we've done it one of the most aggressive drill programs in all of the Yukon this year uh, mm -hmm. about 18,000 meters uh, in uh, 70 something holes uh, and really so we, we have a lot more news to put out not just about the about the blue sky porphyry uh, and we did that we started drilling at uh, the end of March, uh, really good for we were you. Drilling on top of an, yeah, it was it was rough going, <laughs> but <laughs> we were we were pretty dedicated to get in here because we had a target that was underneath a uh, underneath a swamp, and uh, so it was really good to get in when there was frozen ground so that we could drag the drill around on top of that frozen ground. So we had brought one drill in then, and we've been drilling continuously with. Uh, that one drill uh, and brought another one in in May uh, and had two drills from May onwards. Um, and we just finished our last hole uh, about five days ago. Real, wow. March through August. That's, a, that's an aggressive program. 70 holes too. Wow. Good for you. How, how did they spread out across the property, right? We got all these different targets. Uh, early stage stuff, uh, expand uh, step outs on the res on known resources. You have the full gamut of uh, exploration opportunities. That's right. So we had five targets within the the soil soil anomaly that uh, surrounds nucleus and, and revenue. Yeah. Uh, and then we did one drill program, uh, the inaugural drill program on a, a epithermal vein system. Uh, that had never been drilled, but there's some some great uh, channel samples that that were cut across it. Was that Tinta Hill historically? No, that's uh, Irene. Uh huh. And you mentioned Tinta and Rockhaven. That uh, I guess it's an interesting to note the methods that you mentioned um, bringing over are not really you know they're not drilling methods, right? That's there's a lot you can do. Before you get into that, I wonder. Absolutely, I mean, drilling is the most expensive type of all of exploration that you can do. Um, so to de-risk the drilling, it it makes uh, an awful lot of sense to do uh, soil sampling, good surface geology, and uh, trenching and geophysics. Yeah, and uh, ability to do that stuff in the winter pretty limited, I guess. Oh. I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> but yeah. I, yeah. You know, you can you can do a bit of stuff in the winter in the Yukon, but 
um, it's not a it's it's not a favorable <laughs> environment for it. Well, I I read these stories of these guys who would wait till the winter when the fr- ground was frozen so that they could melt you know the the pit that they wanted and get down to the bedrock through the what was mushy you know ground in the summer they would work in the winter on purpose and it's just hard 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 men up there <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah there've been some tough characters working in the Yukon past yeah and i guess history you mentioned it revenue um does it go back to like the 1800s there with some you know known placer mining and underground? Uh, it goes back to at least uh, the 1930s uh, when a, a really well-known guy, uh, like Fritz, I think, Guder, um, his last name's Guder anyway, came into this area and mm-hmm. sort of opened it up. He discovered a lot of gold on Free Gold Mountain and he made his way out to uh, revenue and nucleus where we're working right now and built a bunch of old cabins and came out here uh, doing a bunch of uh, both placer mining and uh, and prospecting uh, opened up the area for basically everyone else that came to follow there was sort of a little mini gold rush out here yeah the history of western canada isn't it <laughs> That's um, yeah. uh, striking to see that the south big creek fault there on the geological map um i wonder you know is that a slip fault what are we is there a sense for what may have happened there uh yeah so the big creek fault is uh it's a crustal scale fault it's it's one of these faults that's been around for a really long time and it goes really deep and it's been reactivated over and over again it's part of the sort of tecton tectonic framework of um, of Western North America, really. Uh, and those types of big salts splay. So they, they have different channels that they, that they uh, or, or conduits that they, they follow. Uh, and the fact that we have, that we are nestled between two splays of that fault um, it, it really is the mechanism for um, the emplacement of the porphyry system that we're looking at. Because yeah. one of the things that you need to get a porphyry system is you need to have space for uh, a magma or an intrusion to make it all the way up to very high crustal levels. Um, and when the the movement on that big creek fault is uh, it's, it's dextral. So um, the, they're moving, the two strands are sliding past one another. Uh, yeah. And in between those two strands, there's a low pressure zone that's what's created um, because of the, the opposite movement on those two uh, strands of the fault. And that allows for an intrusion to come up to high structural level. Um, so that's the the perfect geological environment um, to have a porphyry, and it's part of the reason why we were exploring for one here, and and we found one. Well, and absolutely, that great to hear the crustal uh, feature there, and and the North Big Creek Fault, the South Big Creek Fault, uh, straddling either side of that soil anomaly, and the nucleus and the revenue, all that stuff, wonderful. Um, I wonder what kind of a do you have a sense for the a cap or what may have you know caused it to precipitate gold and copper at those at the levels where it did yeah so i mean we have different um different zones of mineralization that we've discovered throughout the throughout the property uh and some of them come come right to surface is to this one uh, was about what we call the the wow breccia, and we had we sort of defined a zone that we thought was a breccia system, uh, and tested it with uh, five holes and hit with every hole. Yeah. Uh, and so, for instance, we had uh, like 43 meters of 0.8 grams gold and 0.33 uh, percent copper. 
uh, in one hole. And uh, 180 meters of 0.3 gold and 0.16% copper in another hole. Uh, and that wow breccia comes right to surface. Um, and so the top of it is probably eroded away. So we don't yep. know where that top surface ever was. Um, but the blue sky porphyry, uh, as far as we can tell so far, we've actually got the top of it uh, underground. It doesn't daylight, it doesn't yeah. come right to surface. Um, so we have the actual top of that, in, of that uh, mineralized body. And, and that's really good in a way because it means that it's all still there and none of it is eroded away. Yep. Um, what, so these various different parts of the system um, have come up to different levels. It's not like there's just a single uh, yeah. capped level. Um, but we are very close to, to the Earth's surface here, uh, and we know that because we have a great big diatreme right in the center of the soil anomaly, and that's basically a geological word for the, the root of a highly explosive volcano. So we're right underneath the guts of a volcano here. Um, and yeah, I don't know, maybe the mineralization did make it to surface uh, even even when when it was first in place, and and a lot of it has been eroded away since, uh, and that's consistent with there being a bunch of placer gold in the in the creeks as well. Yep, but these things like to bubble up, and not all bubbles reach the same heights here underground, right? Um, and exactly. Yeah. So just because there's one that may have been eroded a bit and let some placer in the area, that's hey, <laughs> well, and it's, it comes back to the deep IP again. It's that's going to answer that question for you in a big way, I think. That's right, and you know we have the we have an idea, um, a thought, uh, which is consistent with most of what we're seeing, uh, that all of the things that we're looking at, the blue sky porphyry, the wow breccia, the epithermal deposit at nucleus, uh, and the diatreme right smack in the middle of the whole thing, we think that all of that may be related to something that's just a little bit deeper than what we've discovered so far. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at doing in the future is uh, using the IP to target um, something for some deep drilling. Uh, and if we can get down to the interface between all of these things that we've got near surface and something that could be quite monstrous that, that is the cause of each of these little things. Yeah. Um, that's really the big prize here. And that's, that's, we're keeping an eye on that big picture as we move forward. Well, and, and, and the time, the sense of time, geological time here becomes really important, right? Like these, are these pretty uh, hundred million year old type uh, porphyry system you're thinking that you're seeing so far? Most of what we're looking at is this, about the same age as Casino, so about 75 MA, uh, or 75 million years old. Yeah. Uh, but it's hosted in, in rock that's about, about 105 million years old. Um, and there may be a stage of mineralization, like lightning may have struck twice. There might be mineralization yeah. from an event at 105 million years uh, and then another younger event at 75 million years, uh, in which case we're looking at sort of two superimposed uh, geological events that, that, and, you know, really, that's great. The more, the better, right? Absolutely. Well, and, and the concentration and mineralization. More confusing. <laughs> it certainly does. And potentially richer, though. Then, you, you know, your hot spots, if, if that same pathway was active, for multiple phases and you get deposition, multiple like <laughs> remobilization, all this stuff. Yeah. Exactly. And Irene and Ridge and Stoddard off to the Southeast there. Uh, it looks like kind of a pretty different setting, uh, maybe, you know, geologically at least, uh, and a lot of faulting kind of in between that section and nucleus revenue. Yeah, so the Big Creek, splays of the Big Creek Fault separate uh, Free Gold Mountain from uh, the, area, the revenue nucleus area. Uh, and Free Gold Mountain is what has Ridge and Stoddart and Cabin yeah. and all those showings on it. Uh, nevertheless, though, 
that mountain is underlain by uh, similarly aged intrusions uh, that were probably brought up to high crustal level, partly because of the big creek fault system. Uh, and then we've got a bunch of epithermal veins and scarns and that sort of thing um, that are probably distal expressions of the uh, porphyry style mineralization. But Wonderful. there is a tremendous amount of structural complication. So one of the interesting things about Irene is that it's way down in a valley near the, the lowest elevation area around Freehold Mountain. And it's an epithermal vein. And if you look up the mountain from Irene, you're looking at the Stoddart Porphyry. So yeah. normally, epithermal <laughs> things are much higher crustal level than porphyries, which are sort of down in the guts of the thing. <laughs> yeah. And there you're looking at, you're standing on an epithermal vein, looking up a mountain at a porphyry. So there's got to be a pretty strong structural, uh, yeah, structural complication that allowed that to happen. Yeah, upside down or multiple, you know, different events as well, could be. That's right. Yeah. Wow. And so, you know, makes for a great science project. Um, doesn't, it can be a difficult business, right? If you start pulling holes that are barren, um, I guess that's hence the market's reaction to your recent news and all this years and years in the making that's right yeah we've been plug plugging away for a long time um but you know it's just a matter of focusing properly so right now we're focusing on this this soil anomaly at revenue and nucleus and we're keeping free gold mountain in our back pocket for the moment and there's no resources on anything there is it just kind of too puzzling to have really taken a run at it or put it together in the past like how much work have you guys have you done there or prior operators on the mountain area in that? Right. So the old timers did a lot of picking around at the near surface um, epithermal veins and, and scarns that are up there. Um, and, you know, I bet you if you piece together all of the drilling and trenching that they did, uh, you'd probably be able to resource on some of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, in the early days when Northern Freegold was looking at the stuff on, on Freegold Mountain, uh, they shifted focus from the scarns and, uh, and the epithermal veins to uh, a porphyry that's exposed near the top of the mountain called Stoddart um, and did the inaugural drilling on, on that porphyry. I think they drilled about uh, 12 or 16 holes. Uh, and you know, with their very first drill hole, they hit... Uh, hundreds of meters of 0.15% copper right from surface. Wow. Um, so that was a pretty great discovery of a new porphyry. Yeah. Uh, and th they drilled it for uh, just two years. Uh, and and then they, they started hitting a lot of really high-grade gold at Nucleus uh, and shifted focus to and really hit Nucleus hard. And that's why we've got um, that, that gold resource at Nucleus now. So again, it was sort of just a matter of, of limited uh, limited resources, and you've got to focus where you can. That's that's the challenge, and the more ground you have, <laughs> the more difficult that becomes, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, so then, time becomes your friend. <laughs> as long as you can, as long as you can keep things going, um, and and you have a variety of targets in your back pocket, you can, you can uh, sort of do what you need to do, which really is either finding or writing, finding something that is economic or writing things off so that you're not wasting time on them and moving on to the next, next good thing. Well, and that puts That's something started. that a lot of exploration companies don't want to do, right? They no, don't certainly. want to write off parts of their property. Um, <laughs> but we're very much open to the idea of doing that because we don't want to waste our time and, and we're not without new targets. Well, and it's tough because you didn't really write off Stoddart yet, you know, like to my mind at least. Absolutely. No, we didn't write it off at all. It's got a ton of uh, potential still. We just moved resources to something that at the time um, was 
was more valuable because we were defining a, a good gold resource on it and yeah. needed to focus our attention there. Well, and all the little white dots in this map in the deck, um, it's quite a lot of holes at Nucleus. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Took a lot to figure out what was going on there and to, uh, and to define that resource. Yeah. And in figuring that out, do you think, um, you know, any kind of scientific breakthroughs on your end? Yeah, so uh, just last winter, we uh, we modeled the we revisited all of the all of the data that we had for nucleus and and modeled it in three dimensions. Uh, and yeah, we have a much better grip on the the geology there now. Um, I don't think that we've we've identified any really spectacular. Uh, exploration opportunities that we didn't know about um, at Nucleus. There's still potential to expand the resource at Nucleus uh, to the south, uh, but at least now we know what's going on there and what to expect when we drill a hole. Um, so we've got you know, a nice 3D model that, that predicts what we're, what we're going to hit yeah. um, geology-wise. Well, and I guess it's nice drilling. Um, I feel like the faulting was before the mineralization. Uh, so, if, you know, if that intrusive, the mineralized body is still cohesive uh, as much as it was when it was in place, then it simplifies things to some degree once you can get a handle on it. <laughs> Ex post, anyways. <laughs> God. Yeah, well, there is a bunch of mineralization at Nucleus that is contained within uh, faulted zones. And in the early days, everyone was... Uh, we were drilling. If if you look at the actual orientation of the drill holes, um, most of them are are west oriented drill holes, and they were drilling up these fault structures that that had the mineralization. And uh, <laughs> there's a bunch of pallets of bentonite up at the site there from when they were drilling up those fault zones because. Drilling up faults is sort of a driller's nightmare. It's really, really hard to do. Um, and then they discovered that those fault zones were important structures for the mineralization. So they rotated the drills around, and now we drill northwards, and yeah. they just burn through the rock in that direction. They don't even understand why anyone would have brought bentonite there. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, this, yeah, it's, well, I'm, I guess consistency um, in leadership uh, within the company or, or an ability to, you know, learn from fast mistakes as needed. <laughs> uh, so how, how long have you been a v VPX? Uh, since uh, January of 2016, so oh. just about a year and a half. Uh, and I did some work for the company in 2016 through my... I had a consultancy, uh, which I gave up to uh, to take over the exploration of the company. Great, it's well, it's uh, it's a big it's a big vessel here. <laughs> so much ground to work. Uh, it's uh, it's almost like you get the variety of a consultant's life, uh, but only working for one company. Oh my. That's right. It's really, you know, an explorationist dream to have all, so many different targets and so many different types of uh, of systems to look at, and to uh, you know, with with Gold Corp's help and with you know the fundraising that that we've been able to do, um, really to not be limited by our ability to to raise money. It's been it's been really pretty fantastic. Well, and for you as VP of Exploration, that must be um i think it's probably a pretty rare <laughs> situation to be in really a well-funded junior mining company is a special thing that's right yeah I've, I've never been in that situation before where basically <laughs> you can do whatever exploration you think is the the right thing to do um and they give you, you know, enough rope came in that's right you know when gold corp came in uh with their 20 percent investment uh, for 6.3 million, um, that was all flow through. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, Wonderful. we have a monstrous budget to spend over the last two years. And uh, I think that 
I think that we've we've shown that that we can spend that money responsibly. We've we've done an awful lot of uh, good work here and uh, and made some some pretty significant advances on the property. Well, the blue you know, sort of culminating with this blue sky zone uh, discovery. Yeah. That's yeah, and that and is it really that is the culmination of that two year uh, runway that Gold Corp gave you? That's right, and even the sort of the preliminary work that we did in 2016. So in 2016, uh, we came onto the property. There was there was nothing really going on here um, at all. Uh, we just came into an abandoned camp and pulled up, pulled out some uh, some core and relogged it. And when we relogged that core, we discovered that uh, there was potential for porphyry mineralization in areas where um, it had had not been explored for in the past. And we presented that information at a conference in the Yukon uh, in November of 2016. And Gold Corp heard that presentation and they were very interested in uh, supporting us doing that exploration in those areas that, that we had identified. Uh, and that was an important factor in uh, their investment in the company. Uh, so then we had the $6.3 million. We did a big exploration project last year, um, discovered a variety of things, but in particular that one hole that had the 50 meters of one gram gold and 0.5, or sorry, 0.3 copper um, in rocks that had porphyry mineralization. Uh, and then this year we followed up on that and that's what led to the, the discovery of the blue sky porphyry. So it's a real um, sort of from beginning to end uh, discovery. Well, and, and early days still, really, because, you know, Gold Corp, I've uh, heard the CEO Garofalo there speak a couple of years ago now, and he was just bullish on doing deals with everybody in the industry, right? Uh, other majors, he wants to collaborate on super projects, you know, juniors, he wants to help fund important, you know, exploration work, like like what you guys have done here, like finding new porphyry, and like, yes, they're, they want to get behind that in a big way. Um, and I look at this regional map loc locally, with coffee nearby and Rock Haven there and others. Um, I wonder uh, about Gold Corp trying to, you know, turn this into a major source of production for them in the future. That's right. And, you know, it, it's hard to say what, what could happen, but, uh, you know, if someone builds a big hungry mill nearby, they're going to need That's feed it. for it, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. I think you've got pro mining. It's it's good to see that the heritage there, respect it, everything's, it's, it's a lot of, all the bad things happening out there in the world, mining, Indonesia, Chile, a lot of drama and, and bad news. Uh, good to be hearing positive stuff out of the Yukon here, work getting work getting done, right? Like that's the thing about an exploration company, people may not realize it's it's kind of your job to spend that money as quickly and effectively as possible. And that's right. And you know, Yukon's got a lot going on right now. There's I mean there's the Minto mine and uh they're building the Victoria Gold is building a mine. Uh <laughs> there's all all of the majors are getting in like Barrick and Newmont, Gold Corp, um, and and it's it's a really good place to work. Just in the couple of years that I've been here, the government support has been unbelievable. Like that uh, geological map that you're looking at uh, in 2016, uh, I was talking to one of the geological survey uh, people. Uh, Mo Colpra, and I, I mentioned that it would be good to have the map of our area updated uh, and improved because we're doing so much work on the property. And then last year, he sent a team in here. They mapped our whole property. Uh, and this year, we have a brand new government geological map. Yeah. Another thing that happened just since I started working here is the government announced infrastructure funding that's turning the road to our camp from a sort of one lane only half maintained by the government uh, dirt road into a two kilom or sorry two lane eighty kilometer an hour entirely government maintained road 
that's the road that comes right into and through our uh, through our operations here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's you know government uh, support in in the best possible way. Yeah. Um, and and another thing about the Yukon is that the the First Nations have for the most part settled land claims here. Uh, and we have uh, two First Nations that we deal with, Little Sam and Carmack's First Nations and uh, Selkirk First Nation. We have great relations with both of those uh, First Nations group. We have all kinds of their citizens uh, working in our camp, and uh, we meet with chiefs and council on a regular basis. We've brought them out for a tour uh, of their property, and we understand the issues that they have with the kind of uh, kind of work that we're doing. Uh, and they understand the benefit of the work that we're doing, and we work together to uh, to to move forward in a way that's beneficial for for all of us. And uh, it's it's really a a very positive place to work in in that regard as well. Scary to be down here in Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, lots of changes in the other direction, maybe here recently. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And that road that comes out from Carmack, Carmack's the town there. That so there's highways around there, but then this was a it was a dirt road, and it was only semi maintained. And they're talking about are they, is that going to be for next year that they're that's going to be. So half of the road is is maintained by the government, and the other half is maintained by us and by Placer Miners. Um, okay. It's a really good road uh as is but it's you know it's it's a bit mucky and slow to drive on and having it upgraded would is really um the the most amount of benefit that comes from upgrading it is in an actual development or mining scenario well and, um, and it, do you, it, do you have a sense for when? That box i'm sorry and do you have a sense for when the government would be you know spending that money doing that work Right. Yeah. You know, it's all kind of rumor right now. Okay. Uh, but it looks it looks like there it's it's going to be uh, two or three uh, phases, and the first phase is what they call the Carmax cutoff, and that's where they put uh, put a, a bypass so that to get onto the road you don't have to drive through the town of Carmax. That's really important because they don't want ore trucks or LNG trucks or a bunch of industry trucks uh, driving through their community. Uh, and we don't want to have to do that either. Um, and it looks like that could start as early as uh, next year. Wow. Well, and, and hearing about how quickly the geological survey was able to jump to it on the, the mapping there, I, I uh, would be another data point that uh, two data points make a trend, don't they? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, and everything else in this area again. I get to see Goldcorp come in to coffee, which, looking at that map, does look a little bit further away, a little more isolated. This, that, it's wonder what the the future of Goldcorp and the others in in this area. It, yeah, we will see. Um, I wonder, Nitro. And the calm, looking at the property map again, those things off to the west. Uh, how much work done on those? Uh, so, calm is just a soil anomaly, uh, and very little work has been done on that. Uh, and nitro is a uh, it's an epithermal system. There's some nice golden veins there. Uh, it's way off on the edge of our property, and it's on a part that doesn't. Uh, doesn't have road access, so you have to use a helicopter to get out there. Uh, and we have so many good epithermal targets that we can drive right up to uh, that we'll probably focus our attention on on those ones for the time being. Uh, but uh, you know, again, these are, are things that we've we've got on our property in our back pocket uh, yep. that we can always shift our attention to after we either make or break some of the other. Uh, exploration targets. <laughs> well, and to accommodate a partner's interest, right? Uh, Gold Corp has to be careful now bumping up against 20% of the company. Um, but <laughs> if there's the potential to raise some more money, dilute them down a bit or have them keep pro rata share as case may be, um, it, it it's good to have all those menu of options of things you can go after 
if different people who are funding Absolutely. you want you to do the different things. Yeah, so I mean, we have all kinds of opportunities to leverage our different showings into uh, into different um, methods of financing. Uh, but the one thing I would say is that I do think that Gold Corp will. Uh, well, if you look at our last financing, Gold Corp upped their um, upped their contribution to the financing from 19.9 to 19.9999. Um, and I, I have a feeling that that you know that they're going to be pretty happy with the results that we put out from this year and we'll always um or f for the near future anyway we can expect that they, they will maintain that that 20 percent interest yeah well and and increasing it becomes a very significant step right if if they go down that line of uh, potential takeout here of triumph at some point yeah, well, there, there's always a, you know, that's that's one of the things that we're kind of working towards. <laughs> Certainly, yeah. Uh, and so thinking about the 10 holes again at the blue sky as an extension or some, there's a fair, you, I believe it was a, a substantial step out from revenue. How far... Are we talking there? Is it several hundred meters from you know the envelope of the resource at revenue, or um, the resource at revenue? It's it's only a an inferred resource, yeah. Uh, and so it, it it was extended pretty far, um, just based on a, a small number of, of drill holes. Um, but we we are outside of the revenue resource with, yes. with this. Uh, drilling, uh, but maybe only by a couple of hundred meters. Okay, so that's um, but that's a good but we're, distance, not too far. Where it's it's centered about um, 250 meters to the east of the main uh, the main geological control on on uh, the re on the uh, resource, which was. Uh, the emplacement of that big dive stream. So the root of that volcano is sort of the geological control uh, that that was thought to be the main geological control for the revenue resource. Um, and we're, we're a quarter kilometer to the east of, of that diatribe. And so thinking about future exploration work here around blue sky and upgrading the, inf the inferred potentially at revenue and you know, future work programs and all that, um thinking about the deposit model here too it's not necessarily the case that we'd expect continuity at surface uh between blue sky and revenue um, but potentially at depth a shared source of fluids at least <laughs> yeah that's the big prize that's what we're that's what we're um refocusing our efforts on on looking at next year um and you know when we get that ip data yeah. um it might it might you know just <laughs> it could potentially really show us a great target down there uh and we have a lot of other evidence from from uh taking another look at each of these different deposit areas uh, or each of these different showings uh, within the broader soil anomaly that these are just little kind of leakages from from something else uh, yeah. and I think that's going to be a very important uh, component of our our project uh, next year but one of the other things that we're also looking at is uh, small things uh, we keep on finding a bunch of, of little things uh, like the wow uh which are uh, <laughs> that you could easily piece together into a, a mineable resource. Mm -hmm. um, so we've kind of got two scales of focus. We've got the scale of focus of near surface, small things, uh, and then the monster beneath that is, has fed these small things. Exciting. And there's no holes that really give a sense for, well, there's, 
I guess that's the point about blue skies. It's it's early days, right? Um, yeah, and trying to figure out how deep that monster might be down there and where exactly it is, and <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna take your full right. exploration arsenal to figure that out. It is, and you know, next year we might you know drill the Yukon's deepest diamond drill hole into oh. the Yukon's richest porphyry. <laughs> <laughs> And and Gold Corp would be right behind you, I think, all the way on that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's it takes a certain um, appetite for risk to even undertake something like that, you know, drill <laughs> deep holes. <laughs> it scares some people off, right? Uh, but hearing you say that, you oh, have absolutely. That, but the, well, and all the surface stuff to go and have as well and the, the, the placer miners near on on site uh, yeah it all paints a pretty nice picture yeah, you know in any given district it's uh, it's funny because nobody drills a deep hole until until one person takes that risk and, and does it <laughs> and in so many places it has panned out um yeah. and yeah. you know i was talking to a guy the other day that said 2000 meter deep hole is the new 500 <laughs> because there's because <laughs> there's so many porphyries that were uh uneconomic when they were just scratching away at the near surface stuff they drilled 1500 meter 2000 meter deep hole into the guts of the thing wow. and next thing you know you're pulling up multi percent copper and uh, and the thing's economic um, and if ever there was porphyry in the Yukon that was worth doing that kind of drill hole into, I think it's, it's this one. Well, and if there was ever a company that was able to, you know, mount that exploration effort, um, it's going to be one that has the full faith uh, Gold Corp, I think, behind it. And, and, and all the other trappings that come along with the successful junior, right? Um, Looking at the other major shareholders and the list of management and directors, not names necessarily that I recognize, um, but that doesn't mean too much. I don't know. I certainly don't know everybody. And I don't know that many people in the Yukon either, really. It's a huge mining community up there. There's a lot of expertise. <laughs> yeah, there's a great survey up here, and there's a, a really kind of close-knit exploration community. We have... Uh, have a couple of uh, technical and investor conferences up here that you always see the same people at, and we yeah. kind of chum around, and it's uh, it's good. It's a it's a good community well, community and, to be a part of. And what about Mr. Reynolds, Mr. Paul Reynolds, there as president and director of, of Triumph? I, I'm I'm not familiar with him. Uh, yeah, Paul has uh, has um, I'm not sure how many decades of experience in mineral exploration, but yeah, yeah. he's a he's a top notch geologist with a, a lot of experience, and we're happy to have him at the helm. And Camp, um, I guess having finished this year, uh, right, closing Camp, you're still up in the Yukon right now, I gather. That's right. Yep. I'm calling. So if, if my voice is a little funny, it's because we're calling over a satellite connection. But yeah, we just finished the last drill hole uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, and so the geologists are just finishing the core logging. We're getting the core cut and sent for uh, assay. And then uh, we'll greatly reduce the, the size of the camp uh, to just a sort of skeleton crew until the, uh, the geophysics crew comes in probably in mid-September, and they'll be uh, uh, running uh, that IP and a mag survey for about two and a half weeks. Um, and then hopefully we'll get, get shut, shut down completely and winterized before the snow flies. You're running that uh, deep penetrating ground IP this year? That's right, yeah. So oh, that we'll be able wonderful. to... Uh, absolutely, yeah. That's part of what we need uh, in our arsenal for... Uh, for planning the drill program next year. So it was sort of, if we were gonna do it, now was the time. And luckily we were able to round up a good contractor to, uh, or a good geophysics company that was able to, uh, able to send uh, the equipment and the team up here. Well, and that can't be taken for granted. 
right? There's a lot of little things that can oh, happen with a successful not. exploration company. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and it speaks to the, you know the fact that you guys are you have a presence there. Um, you have the right connections to, uh, to be able to. When did you? Was that a snap decision? Kind of following some of the holes into Blue Sky, or, or was that something that was well known and planned in advance? The no, we. Uh, I think the seeds of that idea were were planted when we were um, noticing some of the some of the features of the Blue Sky Porphyry and and noticing that it, along with a lot of the other things on within the soil anomaly, seemed to be um, basically they seem to be hosted in rock that's not the cause of the mineralization. So the blue sky porphyry looks for all intents and purposes like the kind of stuff that you would see at related to 75 million year old uh, activity, but it's hosted in rock that's 105 million years old. So to us, that means that uh, there's something deeper that's causing that, that to happen in a passive host, the 105 MA granite um, and that idea sort of sowed the seeds that we needed to do whatever we could to find what that source is yeah, uh, and so we just started thinking about it and then about uh, four weeks ago I think we we kind of pulled the trigger on it and said yeah we, we've got to get this program we've got to get some deep penetrating IP to uh, to sort that out and we designed a program and sent it around to a couple of companies and and fortunately uh we were able to round round someone up that could do it this year and yes. it would be it would be terrible to not have that data for next year or to have to get it in the spring and and have to uh look at it ultra quick um instead we're going to be able to mull it over all winter long yeah and that's so important with that geophysics and the soil, are you going to run the, be able to do the soil the, in, uh, the soils this fall as well? Yeah, the soils are, uh, most of the samples are collected and sent to the lab. We don't have the results yet. Uh, there was one area where, uh, a really critical area uh, that we weren't able to test because there was, a, there was a bear hanging around in there that we didn't want to bug too much. Um, but the bear is gone, so we've got a crew coming back to uh, finish that soil sampling in a couple of days. Yeah, well, and it sound, it may, for anyone listening, yes, it sounds simple, um, but you'd be surprised, <laughs> you know, simple is good, effective is good. It's, it's supposed to be, you know, there's enough challenges in this business, uh, right, that uh, you don't want to have too many problems with your, your field work. You really, it has to be smooth. <laughs> There's always going to be challenges and stuff in the field day to day, uh, but if you get the big pieces in the right places, you have a chance. Yeah, and you know, I, I have to give a shout out to our, our camp crew and our technical team up here because, like you said, it is challenging working in, in these camps and, you know, in the Yukon and being remote and having bears and that sort of thing around. And our crew up here is top notch. These guys are just knocking it out of the park this year. So uh, yeah, I, I've got to give them some credit for that. Wonderful. Well, and thank you for talking to me. Uh, I see that I think we're past an hour here. I'm sorry if I've taken too much of your time, but uh, <laughs> pleasure to share it with the world. Uh, there's a lot of people who need to hear this story. Yeah, no, it was my pleasure. So thank you very much.